Hello everyone, on behalf of the Doing Sociology blog team, I welcome you all to the second episode in a series of interviews that we are doing with academicians. And uh, we are extremely happy and fortunate to have with us today Dr. Rudolf Heredia. Many of you might know him as a teacher. Uh, many of you might know him through his books, such as Changing Gods, Rethinking Conversion in India, Taking Sides, and his many, many other works. Uh, we thank you, sir, for being with us today. And he would be talking about a very pertinent subject in today's context, that is of collective violence. We look forward to hearing your views, sir. And uh, we are also happy and again fortunate to have with us Dr. Dodd Jos, who is the Dean of the Jyoti Dalal School of Liberal Arts. Uh, Dr. Jos has uh, done his uh, bachelor's from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. He has done his master's from JNU and he holds a joint PhD from National University of Singapore and King's College London. Uh, and he has taught in a number of places, including IIT Mumbai, IIM Bangalore, NID Ahmedabad. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you both of you for being with us today. And now I uh, hand it over to Ritupanna to introduce Dr. Heredia. Everyone, it's our pleasure in doing sociology to welcome Heredia, Dr. Heresha to our uh, viewers and listeners. So uh, he is a man who owns multiple hats. He has been a teacher, a scholar, as well as a prolific writer. Uh, we are uh, extremely thankful to him for taking time out, uh, even amidst uh, such a crisis that we are going to, uh, through today. Uh, thank you, sir, so much. Uh, we have one of his students uh, and colleagues, as well as friends, uh, who would give us uh, more insights into uh, what makes the man, who the person is. And uh, he has uh, previously taught in St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, and was also one of the founders uh, of the Social Sciences Center there. Uh, over to you, George. Uh, introduce uh, Rudy to us and uh, what is he like? Uh, what is his sociology like? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dipali and Rituparna, for um, setting up this uh, conversation. And uh, really, it's a, it's a wonderful privilege um, to talk to uh, Rudy, Father Rudolf uh, Heredia, Rudy to, to many of us. Um, Rudy was my uh, teacher um, back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s um, in St. Xavier's College in Bombay, um, and was also incidentally uh, my first employer, as it were. Um, uh, I, I started my career as a research assistant in the Social Science Center, which uh, Rudy had set up um, um, in St. Xavier's College um, back in the 1980s, it was. Um, and what, you know, uh, Dipali and Ditu, bo both of you have already um, um, given a fairly uh, good introduction um, to Rudy, um, and I don't want to really repeat uh, what you've said, um, but what, what, what I, I would like to just uh, highlight uh, a couple of things um, from my experience of, of Rudy. One is as a teacher and really in the late 80s, um, uh, the Social Science Center wonderfully was magnetic, uh, uh, wonderfully magnetic. Um, a bunch of uh, students who were really interested in going beyond uh, the curriculum, so to speak, the people who were interested in the out of syllabus uh, questions. <laughs> and uh, I think, I think uh, that also uh, led to the Social Science Center and Rudy personally uh, being very invested in something that came to be known as the Honours Program in Xavier's. Now, um, you know, the University of Bombay and the University of Mumbai, as it was later renamed, uh, didn't really have an honors program, but I think Xavier's took a very good initiative in trying to bolster the education we were receiving at that time uh, by providing opportunities and vistas for students to pursue uh, their research interests in, in, in numerous sort of ways. And, and the honors program at, in the Social Science Center was, a, was really the place where I was introduced to uh, the development debate, questions around the environment, uh, there were questions around uh, uh, education and certainly 
uh, what later on came to be known as communalism, for instance. I mean, some of the some of the kind of key debates. Uh, Rudy himself had set up a study circle of sorts. Uh, there were there were short-term programs being offered, and it was a generator space, a space where we really learned to become um, uh, uh, scholars and and took our first baby steps in the direction of being researchers. Um, so it was it was a wonderful period um, in my experience at that time. And I'm grateful to Rudy for providing that uh, wonderful uh, context and really um, uh, creating a home uh, uh, for all of our students. So, Rudy, um, wonderful to have you on this uh, on the show and uh, uh, on this conversation. And uh, Dipali and Ritu are going to talk to you about your most recent book, which is in the press at the moment, which is again uh, addressing the question of uh, collective violence of uh, uh, religious uh, strife. Um, but it's also, I thought, I thought it would be nice to also at some point in time think and talk about your work in education and also your work uh, to do with the not-for-profit not world in philanthropy and, and uh, the NGO uh, network, uh, uh, which also you've studied in some detail. Um, but over to over to uh, Dipali and Rituparna now. They will conduct uh, this conversation, and uh, I might just come in uh, briefly here and there um, uh, to 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 not you to speak about certain issues and themes and concerns that we all collectively share. Thank you. Thank you, George. So. Uh... Dr. Radio, we would want to know a little bit from you about your upcoming work and then maybe we could take forward the discussion from uh, what you say. Well, some of it I have put in my bio data, but the inspiration behind the whole social science center was to bring a reflection dimension to action so as to create a praxis. It was not affiliated to the Bombay University and we never sought any academic recognition because that becomes a kind of specialized area, whereas this would reach out to activists and help them in their work. Now, activists and uh, researchers don't always get on because the activists feel they do all the work and the researchers get all the credit and the researchers feel guilty for taking the, the credit from the uh, uh, activists. But some formula must be found, you know, some agreement some kind of collaboration, so it becomes a participatory, participatory research program. And this is what the center did mostly, a study of uh, the one of our organizations called the Maharashtra Pravodhan Seva Mandal. We did a study of the Lhasa schools in the mission, and we did a study of pavement dwellers and a study of urban housing. So these were the three main things we did. Also, we worked with tribals to, to bring out a small uh, on their stories in their own tribal language and in Marathi. You know, one page Marathi, one page their language, the other page Marathi, with a small uh, illustration in it. This was meant to be for, you know, for half an hour in, uh, of a class for a primary school and for neoliterate adults. That was very successful. But the trouble with activists don't follow up. They get new ideas and they move on to other things, you know. <laughs> But also, Rudy, I think, um, you know, in a sense, um, your uh, work as the editor for social action at the India Social Institute also reflects this concern to try and bridge uh, the work of activists and researchers. Would, would you say that? Yes, that's, the journal is meant for that. And uh, when I was editor, we had some good issues and one very lucky one on secularism in December and the Babri Masjid came in January and the Babri Masjid had just come down in December. So that sold out. And then it was put uh, as a special you know, publication gathering all the articles there. But we had good people to write there. I think Bhargava wrote something. No, not Bhargava. The one from uh, Colombia. What is his name? Uh, uh, Bill Grami. Yes, yes. Akil Bill Grami. He, 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 Bill, Bill Grami. he wrote something. So it was a good book. It was a good, good, good read. You know, that was the most successful issue. But social action doesn't have a large distribution. You know, mm -hmm. it's only about seven hundred when I was there. It took it to a thousand. 
but then you, re you don't really push it and you don't have a good article in one issue or the other, then uh, it uh, slides. So, uh, have you been uh, thinking about collective violence in India since then, uh, Rudy, would you say? No, I, I, well, we, we thought of communalism and uh, it was an issue in the 1980s with the uh, riots in Bihondi and then, of course, the Sikh riots in Delhi. You know, it became a big issue. In fact, Pakistan uh, uh, was a much bigger issue than we realized. But it's been somehow healed, but not completely, not completely. And this is a this is something to think about. How is it that the Sikh Hindu divide has been healed, whereas the you know, Hindu Muslim divide cannot be healed, mm. or does not heal? I think there's a lot of uh, information and a lot of insight we can get into thinking about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Claiming that the Sikhs were culturally closer to the Hindus was one thing, but the Sikhs claimed a definite identity and they wanted to express it in the, in politically as a nation, which is exactly what the Muslims were doing. They had a kind of common culture, a common language, even Urdu in two strips, but somehow it was exploited first by the British for partition and then by the extremists on either side. So we are in the bind just now and it began, communism began, it, to be the public issue in 1984, and it's gone on since then. Never look back. Can you can you probably tell us a little bit about your current uh, book, uh, the book that is in the press, uh, Reconciling Difference? Well, yes, I, I came to the idea, you know, uh, after I wrote Changing Gods and I wrote things on, on rethinking conversion and taking sides on affirmative action and reservations. I thought this is a big issue and really it's a disturbing issue because what we are seeing is a kind of violence free floating in the air, a sea of violence. Everybody is getting violent, the speech is getting violent, there's random violence on the streets, you know, there's more rape, there is more robbery, there's more atrocities against Dalits and action against Muslims. So I thought I should work out something to look at the background of this and to see if there is any possible reconciliation. And the book really tries to focus on reconciliation, so not in the pages, but in, in the intention. Uh, if we go down this path, we will not only change our society radically for the worse, we will de-civilize in the civilization. You see what's happened in Pakistan, see what is happening in Sri Lanka, see what is happening in Burma. This ethno-nationalism, especially when it's religious, is a very dangerous thing. So especially when it's majoritarian and authoritarian. So I think we should, all critical citizens should do, think about it. You know, and um, make people uncomfortable with the consequences that they are choosing by putting this government in power. Unless the government changes, which is not very likely in the short term, you know. Um, Rudy, uh, would you talk about what you mean when you say collective violence is, you know, the new normal that we have to live with? Is it related to the past, the violence that we have experienced in the past? See, the, the violence in the past was mostly feudal. And Subramaniam Swami says that it didn't carry over from generation to generation. You know, it was uh, it was like a fight between two groups, and then they would settle it, as they normally do. Or one would win, and the other would lose, and the situation would be would diffuse. The next generation would start anew. What has happened now is that it has been politicized, so that it becomes an ideology that is carried on and on and on. You know, even religion has been politicized, so that you know, Savarkar's famous. Uh, Politicize the Hinduism, no, politicize religion and Hinduize politics, you know, which is the very opposite of what Gandhi was trying to do. Jinnah was similar, but he was more secular in the sense that he wanted a state for Muslims, but it became Muslim nationalism. And he resisted forming a strictly Islamic state in the first uh, speech in the assembly, but the next day he changed. 
But someone simply asked him, is not the Sharia enough for us? Why do we need all this? And he said, of course, the Sharia is enough. So he retreated. Now, why, is, um, why do memories stay with us? The memories are part of our identity and they're always selective. Now, if you have a negative identity, that is, if you define yourself negatively in terms of what you are not, you know, uh, you're not this, you're not that, you're not that, the stronger your identity becomes, the, the more rigid it becomes, the more inflexible it becomes, the more totalitarian it becomes. You know? Whereas if we have um, other identities, more positive, where we define ourselves by who we are, not by who we are not, then I think we can add on more and more identities, you know. So I, this is at the root of it. Now what happens in a situation of rapid change, everyone's status quo is challenged. And then the upper castes and classes are not quite happy with it. The Hindus did not want to be dominated by Muslims in West in, in Bengal. You know, that's really the deepest cause of the divide, I feel. And in Punjab, the Hindus did not want to be dominated by the Muslims. You know? And the Sikhs sided with the Hindus at that time. So they were divided. But these were cultures that worked together for so long. The national anthem of Bengal is written by Tagore. And he's a great hero in, in, in East Bengal. In East Bengal. He's a great hero in East Bengal. Urdu is a foreign language in Pakistan. It comes from India. You know? So there are so many cultural connections which we are now gradually putting to, put, put, putting to bed and we will become very different nations. If you look at the history books of uh, textbooks of uh, Pakistan and India, you think we are talking about two separate planets. You know? So uh, this, is, this is one of the things I feel we should be doing, uh, working out the reconciliation with Pakistan. It's very difficult to do it now with the military in power. Very few military regimes do it. But we had a chance with uh, Musharraf, where he made a proposal, a five-point proposal on Kashmir, if you remember, to uh, make the line of control porous, at least to Kashmiris. And it was accepted by Atal Bihari, with Atal Bihari Vajpayee, but rejected by Adwani, who was home minister at the time. And I think that was a big step back. It started the whole thing again. You know, and we've never really come to a point of reconciliation with all our surgical strikes. You know. Uh, Rudy, I would like you to talk maybe a little bit more about uh, the relationship between violence and memory that you briefly mentioned. Say, uh, you know, uh, memories of the partition maybe, or uh, if you say, uh, look at the question of Kashmir, uh, you know, even then memories have been referred to often. So a little bit more about uh, rep, uh, memory and violence, the way you see it. Yeah. Let me start by saying that sometimes Violence is considered as uh, honoring the dead. Those who have died in the riots, we must revenge them. Now, this is a very different understanding of justice than the normal one. You know? the revenge is never part of any justice system, although it, retribution is. And what happens is that families make stories, they make traditions, and it goes from one generation to the next. And the loyalty to the family commits them to the this opinion. So you will find in South Delhi that most of them are immigrants from Bengal, from West Pakistan, from Punjab, West Punjab, and they are very anti-Muslim. Also, I think the memories of the past, as I said, give us an identity in the present, and so we want the memories of the past to be glorious. You know? And if they are not glorious, we deny them. So we deny 1,000 years of Muslim rule in India, which was actually a very high, uh, very high cultural period of ours, you know, with the Mughals, especially up to Shah Jahan and up to Dara Shikoh, you know. If Arunzeb hadn't come and history would have been different, you know. Now these are accidents of history, but you know, we should not submit to them. It's a pity that the Ganga, Yamuna, Tehili has, has been put, put to bed. But they were extremists who had a uh, 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 kind of interest in this division, in this polarization. Who profits from the polarization? The leaders of the two groups. 
common people do not profit in each group do not profit by him very much they are the victims of the riots on both sides you know they either stay in the background and make speeches to motivate them so they and what they do is they revive hurt and wounded memories so you hear the slogan pakistan ya qabristan so the whole idea is that pakistan was the homeland for muslims they should all go there the india decided they wouldn't be so we decided that pakistan seceded from us and that we would be a secular nation and it took a lot to get that through because there were many very conservative hindus in the assembly and even in the congress party including rajendra prasad and it took ambedkar and nehru and uh, patel all their skills to guide this through especially on minority rights on religious freedom on fundamental rights so what has happened is that uh, the implementation of this we haven't followed the guiding principles of the constitution the directive principles of the constitution that gives you the spirit of the the the, the law in the constitution and we missed out the guiding the directive principles are not justiciable justiciable the, the constitution is justiciable you know so we took it for granted and we left it unless there was political pressure on it like for reservations but there were many other things over there you know which we have ignored and now we are paying the price for it where people do not have a kind of understanding or a, a constitutional loyalty i think the preamble is something that we should begin to make come alive again because it's a good summary of what the whole constitution is you know? so uh, rudy uh, we were talking about violence and uh, the unlearning of violence so how do you see if it's happening and what role can the youth play in it since you also talk about the role of the youth see uh, first of all we must understand that violence is something negative it is not something positive ahimsa is a double negative so okay. We be the opposite of violence would not be non-violence. It would be ahimsa, which Gandhi said would be equivalent to to love, to Christian love. You know, Christians don't do keep that that commandment of love at all. It's difficult to do it. But this is the ideal that we would live in fraternity. We would live with in brotherhood, you know, with one another. Now. how can we unlearn this see nobody thought that the indian would come together in a non violent movement for independence so gandhi is managed to do that and it's a miracle how he succeeded so he uh, was very clear that the means must uh, must not justify the ends you know that means and ends must both be just so the end did not justify the means now i think violence comes really from in in insecurity something unfulfilled in us and we then project it outside okay? i think people who have a, a low opinion of themselves indulge in violence and they, and they become bullies gandhi was a man with an iron will and still he was so gentle and uh, uh, you know uh, really a prophetic figure so was mandela you know so was martin luther king so i think violence so we manage we let us go by examples another great example is khan bahadur shah khan of from from gandhi of afghanistan we made we managed to change the basic value of the pashtun society with your honor and therefore you know revenge if somebody violated your honor of you or your clan or your family He changed that to non-violence, and he called him the Kudai Kitmagar, the warriors of God. And then a story which may be apocryphal, I don't know if it's true, that the the the, the British began to sh the, the, the non-violent procession was being opposed by the British, and they sh it had Nepali soldiers to shoot them one by one. And then in the end, the Nepali soldiers, in disgust, threw down their rifles and got court-martialed. that is the power of non violence we see the gain at the salt march we will put this off
Ram, uh, Ram Mohan Gandhi has a wonderful article, a book on him uh, for, for non-violent freedom movement, you know. And it, it has a chapter there on uh, Gaffar Khan. So I think it is possible to unlearn violence, but we must be willing to look into ourselves. We must be willing to trace the source of violence in ourselves, not in others. I'm not, we, we justify violence, you know, people are sometimes say things like, I am I'm very hot tempered, you know, you should be embarrassed, you should be ashamed of saying something like that. Don't say, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very short or very tall, you know, no. it's physical defect. So, similarly, uh, uh, anger can be a psychological defect, but it becomes a, a, a part of us. Now, we have a culture of competition which thrives on violence. In the end, we, we base us, how we think of the other depends precisely on how we will relate to the other. If we think of the other as an opposition to us, then we will think of, we, we will not relate to him uh, properly, you know. We will relate to him negatively. If we think of the other as a compliment to us, we will relate to him otherwise. So the essential thing to learn is tolerance. Tolerance and then express it in dialogue. That's the only way we can unlearn violence. You know, how do we get, the, what is the opposite of violence would be compassion. So how do we get compassion? How do we get that feeling for others? One of the things in sociology we learn is to do a reciprocity of perspective. To see things from the other person's point of view. You know, that was Weber's uh, Westerhin. You know? uh, we, we don't do that when it comes to public life. Now what happens is our insecurity with the changes going around with the individual creates a, a very insecure crumbling character as, a, as Parker describes. And what then the, the character looks for support from wherever he can get it, from any scaffolding he can hold on and he becomes part of a community that is also experiencing the same thing with other individuals. And then you get a community which is full of violence and hate because they are insecure, they don't realize, I, I give this example, in India Hindus are insecure and they are in the majority, in Pakistan Muslims are in, uh, insecure and they are in the majority, in America Christians are in the majority and they are insecure, so the insecurity doesn't come from the other, it comes from ourselves. Now I think we need to address that, you know, now uh, we did it in the freedom struggle. We brought many people together, but that was Gandhi's genius. You know, he managed to do that, and there would have been much more violence if he hadn't done that. So, unlearning violence is learning tolerance. It's learning dialogue. You know, think of uh, South Africa and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It did wonders. It's a real miracle that there wasn't a bloodbath over there. But we, we decided that both sides decided that something has to be done. There was some sort of common ground on which to meet. You know? And they began with an agreement on two things, minority rights and property rights. So the white minority felt secure economically, politically they were not so secure. But they felt that it was worthwhile because they could not carry on the violence. If Gandhi said very well, you know, Revenge, an eye for an eye, would make the whole world blind. I don't think we realize it enough the negative side of violence because we're so used to it. After a war, nobody wants violence because they've seen what it does. Then we forget. We've had continuous war on this planet since the Second World War. Somewhere or the other, there's a brush, brush war going on, you know. And the, why is that so? At the UNESCO um, manifesto begins with all uh, violence starts in the hearts of men and therefore we must address it over there. So we need a change of heart and it is possible. It is possible to begin with a low level of tolerance, at least allowing each other to live and, and little by little accepting responsibility for the other, working together with the other and finally, you know, a, a kind of uh, union with the other. Now, I think dialogue also is possible. Because we, 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 if we can find common ground, we must want to dialogue. You know, if people are profiting by violence, as politicians do, they don't want dialogue. They will kill any peace effort. So 
it's basically, there was a seminar in Shimla which worked on this, on the, on the concept of violence, and the book was published by some Mukherjee, and it's called Unlearning Violence. You know? So we must not only unlearn violence, we must learn non-violence, we must learn Ahimsa. Ahimsa depends on Satya, Satya Raha. You know? So it is a difficult thing, which it's a long-term investment. Gandhi was never in a hurry. In 1925, the, the civil disobedience movement was at a peak and it had brought the British to their knees. Then Chauri Charasa happened. And he realized that people hadn't re understood what he meant by non-violence. And he stopped the movement and everyone was against him. He would have got freedom much earlier, but he really, we were not, he realized we were not ready for freedom. He wanted us to wait. And, and to learn what non-violence meant. And actually very few people understood Gandhi uh, during his lifetime. You know, once he died, then he became you know, a great hero. I think towards the end of his life, he was considered uh, uh, an embarrassment because he wanted to not still carry on with non-violence and his last dream was to walk across Pakistan and meet Abdul Khan, the Khan in Peshawar. You know, and of course, that would have really set the whole question of the partition into doubt. Now, he, well, he was killed before that. So let me summarize this by saying is that violence is something that is in our hearts, and therefore we must exercise, exercise it from our hearts first. We, we must find a new way of relating to each other in society. Covid is forcing us to do this. We, we cannot relate in the old ways anymore. We have to find a way of social distancing without really uh, psychological distancing from each other. Okay. So let me put it like this. Tolerance is the condition for dialogue and dialogue is the means to diffuse violence. Okay, I think that's enough yes, for that. Uh, yeah, Rudy, thank you. I think you've uh, put it wonderfully, you know, collective violence and then linking it to dialogue. Uh, I would here like to uh, refer to your previous writings uh, on dialogue. Uh, maybe if you could tell us briefly about uh, what do you mean when you say that dialogue is pedagogic? Uh, and uh, when you say that, uh, do you also uh, speak from your own experiences as a teacher uh, of sociology? Well, I always told my students, I learned more from than I talked. Because if you're open to the other, you learn a lot. And dialogue means that. It means opening yourself to the other and seeing yourself in the other and the other in yourself. And that makes for a new relationship. Now we learn, we learn, this, this is a learning experience. See? And once you, the relationship starts, then you learn together many things. So we learn peace, we learn tolerance, we learn the beauty of the other, you know. And this is the basis of dialogue. We need to have a triple dialogue with the poor, so that we will have compassion and understand them, with cultures, so we can have a good interculturality, and finally with religion, so we can have interreligious harmony and peace. So dialogue is the way of being human. Human beings cannot do without conversations. Every conversation is a dialogue, really, you know. Unless uh, you become a leader who speaks only from his mind and it's a monologue, you know. You notice that authoritarian leaders speak with, with, uh, with a monologue. There's no dialogue. There is no feedback. You know? So th then it doesn't, they don't learn anything from others. If you don't hear others openly, we will never learn from them. But dialogue has two conditions. It must be equal, so that you know both partners feel you know uh, not uh, not imposed on, and it must be open and that is be honest. So you must say what you mean. One way of starting a dialogue is to I told I said last time is to ask the other to what they think of you as a, as an individual or as a group. Uh, the other thing is, 
and, and see if you recognize yourself in it, and that becomes the starting point of saying, why do you think so of me, this of me, and because I don't think that of myself. Now, we must find some common ground. Sports makes a good common ground, because sports, you know, everyone wants fair play. Cricket is the great religion of India now, and cricket could, for peace is something which could work, you know. And in many places, they have these youth leagues, which work with a mixed team. And the team bonds together, and this bonding of pe people of different uh, cultures and religions and languages in the team makes a, a beginning in the community dialogue. But we, we are stopping this. We are dividing and polarizing a society so that there is less and less communication between people and communities. If you notice that the minorities are very silent in these days. They are afraid, they are insecure. This is a bad situation because someday it's going to boil over. Right. So uh, when we are talking about learning and dialogue, um, do you think uh, you can draw from your experience, from your PhD days and your time in Chicago, uh, since we study so much about uh, the city in sociology also, uh, what uh, could we, you know, draw from that experience? And if you'd like to say anything to young researchers. Well, uh, the, university, the University of Chicago was uh, very focused on one thing, academic excellence. It's the only thing that counted. And uh, it was very competitive. In that sense, I, I always say there's something wrong with it, you know. Uh, some departments were more cooperative than others, but many departments were very competitive. Now, I think the focus on the on intellectual excellence was good, but it was too one-dimensional. And it was uh, quite a difficult thing for me to make up uh, all the readings and so on, which I hadn't done. So. It was a positive experience in learning. And I learned a lot from others who might be study in a group. There were people, my experience was a group study, really. And there was one uh, divorced woman, there was one uh, faculty wife, there was one uh, Filipino American Buddhist, there was one Marine, and there was myself. You know. So we studied together, and that helped us. See, we must have some sort of cooperation, you know, a group effort. It's much easier when you do it together than when you do it alone. And we would share and, and exchange with one another what we had read and what we had learned, etc. And prepare for the exam like that. Often you, you prepare on your own, but then you isolate yourself completely. So I think group learning is much more effective. And that did not happen in Chicago, because, but it, it could have happened if, if students came together. The thing about the University of Chicago is that the faculty was very good. They, were all, they, they had a, a firm grasp of their subject. They were not always the best teachers in the world, but they were very good at consulting. Every professor had to keep office hours and you could make an appointment and see him during that time if you wanted. But let me give you an example of how rough the teaching could be. The statistics professor came and said, looked around the class and said, all those who, who got C in the last statistics course should not be in this class. It was a kind of joke for many who, who didn't know statistics and were struggling with it, you know. Then he, he tells us, read the first chapter and come. In the next class he asked us, any questions? People were too intimidated to ask a question. So he said, all right, read the second chapter and come. End of class. Then the third day he came and the same thing happened. And then someone asked a question. He said, ah, oh, now we can start. See, he wanted the teaching to be a dialogue. And he was a great statistician, Louis Goodman. You know, so, and he was very good at teaching. You know, he would taught us statistics very well, you know. Even those who didn't know much mathematics and learned a lot from him. You know. But this was the, 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 you had to work on your own, but they gave you guidance. They accompanied you in, in the work you did. 
but you had to do the work on your own. They never, you were never spoon fed. Another professor, you know, would say that, uh, you know, he would correct our papers and say, I'm, some have I'm, I'm given good and some have given uh, uh, excellent. I, I, I really don't know which is better, you know. So it was the effort was really on producing something intellectual in and writing about it. You know? All the exams in, in Chicago were written. They were not oral exams, and all of them were take-home exams. So they were, you learnt a lot by doing these exams. And they, you had great freedom. You could choose any course you like if you, if you were approved by your advisor. Not just in the subject that you were graduating in. So it was a university that was certainly one of the best in sociology, and it had a combination of uh, both the uh, quantitative and qualitative teaching, which was uh, important at that time. Today, I think people understand that the difference and the need for both. So at that time, people were leading more towards the quantitative stuff, trying sociology, trying to imitate economics in the 70s. But now it's not so. I think anthropologists have taught us the value of qualitative learning. So my years in Chicago were, the, the PhD thesis was a very difficult thing for me. Because I did my field work in Bombay and I had no research assistants. I had a few students to help me. And interviewing faculties, college faculty, is not an easy thing. You know, they don't really give it easily. So I had I spent one hour for, with the professor, I still remember that, persuading him about the importance of this. And I thought he would agree to the interview. At the end of the hour, he says, No, I don't want to give you the interview. So you have difficulties in the field, you have difficulties in analysis, but you have good guidance. That is important. You know. I think sometimes the PhD guides here do not accompany students enough. You know, in some places, we just ask you to write your dissertation and come back. Here, the, the process was you had to pass the your, your, your presentation of your, your dissertation first. You know. And that was very difficult. Many people were stopped at that stage. If you got through the presentation of your, of your summary of, the, of your thesis of what you intended to do, and if the committee thought it was worthwhile and it was feasible, then you, they would, you, you would have to work toward your PhD and you mostly you got it. Because it was already screened at the previous level. Now this is not done over here. Now they are screening candidates, but they are not screening dissertation topics. So people choose a topic and then often reach a dead end. One of the things was that the faculty would be able to tell you, they knew enough about the subject to tell you where not to go, but they would make you let you find out where to go. And, you know, and, and that I think was a good experience. And what my PhD did for me in Chicago was to give me a certain intellectual confidence that I could manage to do this on my own. It didn't make me dependent on the teachers. So, uh, I think JNU does that, or used to do that, but I don't know if it does it anymore. But many universities in India just don't do that. You know, They, they, they just you know, they give you the PhD you know, for, for any kind of thesis that you write. And the referees are not very strict. Uh, Rudy, uh, thank you so much for uh, being part of this conversation with us. Uh, you know, we've learned so much from you, from your own experiences. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it has been just wonderful uh, listening to you. We thank uh, you and we thank George as well for both of you giving us time and participating uh, with us in this uh, discussion. And uh, we really hope that our viewers uh, learn from whatever you've told us today and we really hope that uh, your forthcoming book which is uh, we, i think which will be out soon uh, on collective violence uh, everybody is going to get a copy and they're going to read it uh, so thank you again and it has been wonderful uh, talking to you let me say in conclusion i would urge that we start a 
the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in this country. I don't think we are ready for it now. But maybe in small groups, the things are already begun in neighborhoods, in Mohalla committees, etc. And it could work into a movement. Because I think tolerance and dialogue is the way out of this pit in which we have dug ourselves into. And strong men are not going to help us. Strong men will make us more independent. I think we should have the confidence of Raymond Panikar. And this is what he said, and I'm going to quote him, and I put it down over here. I left as a Christian, I found myself as a Hindu, and I returned as a Buddhist without ever having ceased being a Christian. That I think is important, that we have enough confidence in ourselves to relate to the others and to change. And this is, we cannot tolerate of the others, it does not happen. And if we don't dialogue with the others, it does not happen. So the basis of any kind of reconciliation is, is tolerance and dialogue. Indeed, I hope we can learn the values of tolerance and dialogue as well. And actually, uh, there is reconciliation. Thank you so much, Rudy. Uh, we look forward to your coming book, Reconciling Difference, Selective Violence in India. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you for calling me on your show, on, on, on the program. I wouldn't say it's a show, it's a program. And I hope it works well, because you will have many interviews and you put them together and it can surely add up to something different from a classroom sure. teaching. Sure, sure.